and that being successful at something was more of a decision than it was granted. Hi there. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and in fact, it is the 372nd episode. That's right, this is episode 372, and today I'm joined by Mr. Mark Miller. Here at Whistlekick, my name's Jeremy. Sometimes I'm called Whistle Prez. (laughs) <laughs> one of the weirder nicknames I have, but you know what? It works, doesn't it? Because this is Whistlekick. I'm the president of the company. I founded it because I love the martial arts and I'm doing everything I can to support the martial arts, to give back. And this show is one of those things that we do. You can find all of the episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you want to do something for us, you can head on over to whistlekick.com. Use the code podcast15, save 15% on the uniforms, on the sparring gear, on the sweatshirts, the sweatpants, sneakers, so much cool stuff over there. It's about three quarters of my wardrobe at this point. (laughs) Now, today's guest, we've got some mutual friends. And that usually bodes well. If I know people in common with someone, we usually have a good conversation. But today we had a great conversation. It's always a good time when I get someone on the other end of the line who spent some time podcasting, and Mr. Miller is one of those people. Now, he's not podcasting about martial arts, but it still led to some excellent conversation, and conversation I'm sure you're going to enjoy. So here it is. Mr. Miller, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on the show. Um, A martial arts friend of mine, Greg Wareham, is a huge fan, and he said great things about you guys, so I'm honored to be here. Well, I'm honored as well. Craig has been a great guy and an immense supporter of, of everything that we've been doing. And, and just, you know, I really value his friendship and I'm, I'm pretty sure he's listening and I'm pretty sure he listens regardless of whether or not he knows people on the show. So I could guarantee you he is. <laughs> I'm sure he, me, so. he better be anyway. You know what? We could, why don't we just dedicate the show to Craig Wareham? There we go. For all he go. Does for the martial arts. Yes. yes. Someone who definitely does not get the recognition That's that right. he deserves. Like honestly, so many. It's true. It's true. You know, the recognition that we seem to toss around in martial arts is limited to a very few. And while, you know, those few, and I'm, I'm intentionally not going to name, name names, um, you know, the folks that we, we think of when we think of honoring people in the martial arts, it's so easy to forget that without some of the quote unquote lesser important folks who their role was to teach and pass on to that person who did the same to that person who did the same for that person led to this person that we now know of from whatever means. And without those middle dominoes, it, nothing would have happened. Yeah. You know, Jeremy, I think you, you bring up a fantastic point and we definitely have our heroes in the martial arts and names that we would all know. But, um, you know, I've been around for a long time and, and the real heroes to me are the people that were my instructors that not everybody would know, but the people that uh, whose lives they've touched certainly know them. And there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of a lot of great people and a lot of heroes and a lot of, uh, you know, sort of silent heroes, I guess I'll call them throughout the martial arts. That's that's a real good, real good point. Yeah, yeah. That term hero is kind of funny because it's it's one that we all use, mm-hmm. and to be honest, most of us use it wrong. And I may just have. <laughs> <laughs> and and I don't and I don't mean that in in to me a hero and and I think most people a hero is someone who goes above and beyond mm. at their own sacrifice right yeah then and, I, I used it right yeah yeah and and I think that quite often and and I'm I am not going to name any of these these people or professions or or industries because that's when it starts to get polarizing right that's when the subjectivity comes into play right but when we talk about martial arts instructors. There's this wonderful graphic that I saw going around social media and it was two people bowing and it was one, it was clearly one was a student, one was the instructor and the student had a small puzzle piece missing from them Mm -hmm. and the instructor was giving them that piece, but you, you saw that they had quite a few pieces missing from them. Right. And the, the, the takeaway was that martial arts instructors tend to, give of themselves to their students, oftentimes to their own detriment. Yeah, I gotcha. It's like and that, uh, Shel Silverstein book, The Giving Tree. 
Yeah, yeah, very much like that. It's wonderful book. Analogy. It's a wonderful book and it's a great analogy. And and I think as a martial artist that rung a little differently to me than than other people. And I'm sure most of the people listening know the giving tree, but it's 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 a tree that uh, befriends somebody and keeps giving bits of it, starting with its fruit and ending with its, you know, the trunk of the tree for the the person to build a house until there's nothing but a stump there. And then the, the guy ends up as an old man having a place to sit because the stump's still there. Yeah. And uh, boy, if that's not a lifetime martial arts instructor analogy that just works, I don't know what is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Quite, quite appropriate, I, I think. Yeah. And so when we think about heroes in the martial arts, you know, if a hero is someone who goes above and beyond to their own personal sacrifice, I mean, how many school owners out there are teaching simply because they, they love it? Mm hmm even when they don't love it that day or that week or that year yeah. at sacrifice to their friends, their family, and sometimes their, their professional career development, finances, et cetera. Yep. Absolutely. And not to say that people who, you know, have a, a strong, successful school and make good money it's, and, and have a good life balance aren't heroes. But if we take the 800 foot view, there are a lot of martial arts heroes. It's true. And I think that, um, you know, I think you're really hitting it on the head. I think that if you, you know, their students, the parents of those students, those are the people that are looking up to that instructor and, and, and really appreciating everything they've given to them. And I can tell you why that instructor does it. Um, and it's why I do it. And it's because somebody did it for me. So if we go back to the piece analogy, I feel almost like I have a bucket full of pieces that I need to give away at this point because somebody filled that bucket up for me. So mm. it's time for me to give back. And I think that that's really what, you know, that lineage of the martial arts and those instructors and people that we call heroes. I really think that's what's going on there is that somebody gave them something that they appreciate and they're just paying it, paying it back by providing it to their students. Wow. That's such an elegant way of extending that analogy, you know, that you're, you're passing on pieces because they were, they were given to you. I, I really like that. Yeah. And now this might be a good time for us to, to take a step back because, you know, we launched into conversation and I absolutely love when that happens, you know, talking about pieces being passed on, but we haven't, we haven't even talked about you or, or your martial background or anything like that. So let me, let me kind of roll back the tape and we can, we can ask the, the quote unquote boring question of how did you get started? Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't have a very, um, uh, you know, a lot of people, I think when they talk about their pathway to the martial arts, there's some profound reason why they enter the martial arts. My story's not that. I, uh, so this is roll back to like 1983, right? And um, I used to, I was about somewhere around 13 to 15 years old. And I used to spend my Friday nights at Happy Wheels. Um, skating around in circles to songs. I was a younger kid there. And, you know, this was a time when there were some young ladies at Happy Wheels that I thought might be kind of pretty and that I was interested in. And at the same time, I would lay on the foot of my parents' bed and watch, I think, like, you know, one of the Channel 56 uh, uh, channels at the time would just play Bruce Lee movies on a loop. And, and just cycle through all of them. So I'm watching Bruce Lee flip around these nunchucks. And in my adolescent brain, I came up with this brilliant theory that if I could use nunchucks like Bruce Lee, specifically nunchucks, that maybe some of these girls at Happy Wheels that I thought looked pretty good might start paying attention to me because they weren't. And um, so this led me to ask my mom, hey, can, we, can I learn nunchucks? And my good friend, Bill Sisler, um, was studying martial arts at a local dojo. It was a Bob Meserve's Health and Self-Defense um, right in Exeter, New Hampshire. And this Bob Meserve, Master Meserve had um, a few of these uh, throughout like Northern Massachusetts, Southern New Hampshire in that area. And um, so we went down to our local uh, dojo and talked to the instructor kind of on the recommendation of my buddy and his parents. Um, and I stood there and said, I want to learn in Chucks. And I got this kind of look from the instructor. And he took a pause and he said, well, we can't just teach it in Chucks. Like you've got to study the martial arts. And as part of your martial arts training, you 
we, you know, you might have an opportunity one day to learn nunchucks. So this fantasy in my head of swinging around nunchucks and being really good at it and maybe, uh, you know, maybe saving, we talked about being a hero earlier, maybe saving one of these young ladies and, and, uh, and, and gaining her interest started to crumble a little bit. And I thought, wow, this sounds like a lot of hard work. And, uh, the, the story that everybody loves me to tell at this point is that I also used to come home in, in, in my uh, adolescent way. And one of my favorite things to do after school was to watch Charlie's Angels because of the incredible, intricate uh, plot and acting that went on in the show that I was interested in at this age. And I actually had a moment where I had to decide whether or not I was going to take this leap and study this you know, weird karate thing. So I could eventually get to these nunchucks or if I really wanted to continue making sure I had watched every single episode of these Charlie's angels reruns. And, uh, for some reason I made the right decision and I decided that I was going to sign up and start taking lessons at my local dojo. So not profound, just silly teenager trying to work out a way to be more appealing to the young ladies. And possibly the most honest origin story we've ever had in 300 and whatever episodes. <laughs> I love it. I'll try to be honest, but <laughs> that, that's it. And it's, it's true. I really did. You know, I had these fantasies worked up where we would be leaving Happy Wheels and there would be the bad guy, you know, like the Karate Kid, right? Like, yeah. like, uh, like Johnny would come up and be giving one of these girls a hard time and I'd somehow have a pair of nunchucks and, you know, you can fill in the rest. <laughs> So I got to ask, mm -hmm. did it ever work? No. Oh. No. no. <laughs> well, actually, yes. By the okay. time I became a, a, a instructor, a couple of my uh, girlfriends, and of course I was very young when I was having these initial thoughts. So, you know, later in my high school career and stuff like that, I did, did meet a couple of uh, great girls that, uh, that I had good relationship with through the martial arts. And... Um, Certainly, uh, it probably pay, plays a much larger role as me, uh, with me as a father and, and my family and stuff like that. That's really, really where it ended up paying off. Now, of course, any of us in hindsight, anybody who's, anybody who's ever been a teenager, which is probably the majority of people mm -hmm. listening to this show, knows that the personal development side of martial arts can have a, a pretty profound impact. And, mm -hmm. you know, at that time of your life, I can imagine that a lot of the things that you were facing and feeling were likely helped, dealt with, uh, lessened at least yeah. from your time training. Is that fair to say? So this is where it does become profound and, and, and you're very, very astute question because, you know, it was the martial arts was delivered to me in this, in this kind of silly way. Um, but it was something that I, I needed at the time. So I was, I was struggling in a couple of different ways. Um, one of them was I was str struggling athletically. I, I really had a hard time connecting with team sports and I wanted to connect with team sports. Um, but it, it, sometimes I kind of would do okay. And, and more often than not, I would, wouldn't do very well. I had tried hockey and um, my own teammates sort of made fun of my inability to skate. Um, at the time I started karate, I was actually on a baseball team. And I was such a poor baseball player that my own team would make fun of me. You've got to be bad, not to, not to have your own team on your side. Um, but I, you know, I kind of stuck with it and, and tried to do these things. And uh, at the same time as I was kind of having that struggle, the bigger struggle for me really came academically because um, I had ADHD, have ADHD. And at the time, I didn't know this, right? It's not, but this, again, roll back to um, the early 80s. You know, we didn't, it, it wasn't quite the same thing. I was on a 504 plan through school. I'd been diagnosed with this ADHD. My parents at the time had chosen, and I really agree with the choice, especially uh, given the knowledge that they had at the time, but they had chosen not to put me on any kind of medication and really to try and give me the help I needed through process and, and those kind of things. But it was, it was difficult. Um, and I didn't know this. I didn't have this label on myself at all. All I knew is that my friends were getting good grades on the test. And when I would ask them how they knew the information, they would say, well, it's because the teacher said it. And I would have no recollection of the teacher having said those things. 
um, you know, just as, as one real specific example of how it was affecting me. I would be pulled off into different classrooms to get different levels of help while my friends stayed uh, in, in the normal classroom and things like this. So when I started in the martial arts, it gave me my first successes. I was much better at an individual sport and at working on personal growth and at the one-on-one -on -one type help that an instructor can give you, even in a group class, right? Like I was fine in those group classes, but somebody's always kind of like really looking out for you. And I learned that if I'm using my body, I can focus. So even to this day, I still work out a lot. I still do a lot of different things in the martial arts and just work out in general. I don't put headphones on. I'm not that guy. And the reason is, is because that is my time to focus. I don't need the distraction. If I'm working, I'm listening to music. I'm listening to podcasts like, like this one. Um, I need a distraction to keep me focused, as in, in, is, is weird as that sounds. But when I was moving my body, doing the martial arts, I was focused. And that became a template that I could start to work with and apply to other things. And I actually developed structures through the martial arts that made me more successful academically. I wouldn't say that it was a perfect solution, but it certainly, and, and I think this is really what a lot of the Eastern philosophy shows us, shows us and in, in, in learning some of these Eastern philosophies, I was actually conscious of applying this, but the martial arts became kind of an analogy for how to focus and how to structure and how to learn that allowed me to be more successful in these academic settings. And I actually started as I went into high school, not again to have 100% success, but to build some successes because of what I was learning through the martial arts. And then, of course, all of the, the way I felt about myself, having being a baseball player whose own team made fun of them, um, being uh, an unsuccessful basketball player, being a hockey player whose team made fun of them, I started to become somebody that other students looked up to in the dojo and myself, my, the perception of myself and my self-worth completely changed. I was admired by my instructors for my successes. And as you know, karate instructors are just very good at, at building up their students and, and pointing out how they're doing well. And, um, and, and it really started to reforge who I was and how I thought about myself in a way that was incredibly positive. And if my mom was here today on this podcast with us, she would say, because you said it before, that martial arts saved me at a time when I was struggling. So as odd as that origin story is, that's what it quickly became to me. Hmm. Wow, there, there's a lot there. We we could we could take a lot of different directions. We sure could from, yeah. from everything that you just said. And I think it's pretty natural that at that age, we we want to be accepted. I I think that's you know there, I've I've read some interesting psychology sociology stuff around that, especially around that age. Our desire to be accepted mm -hmm. is a, uh, pretty strongly tied to how we define ourselves, our our own self worth. So I'm curious, you know, not finding that success in baseball, your own team making fun of you. How did your time in martial arts, or hopefully early on even, change that? I mean, change, well, you know, it, it, well, it, admittedly, that wasn't the best way to ask the question, but I think you know where I'm going. Yeah. I, okay. I, I do. Yeah. No, no, okay. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I know I'm throwing a lot out. So it's, I know you're, for, you're formulating thoughts as we're as, just like <laughs> I am as we're going here. So it's all fair game. Um, but I, I really, I really do kind of feel where you're coming from there. And, it, you know, I mean, I think the first way that it changed me is that it gave me some confidence. You know, um, I think that when you're not confident as a young person, sometimes you don't realize that you're not confident. And what I mean by that is you've been on earth so little time, that it's just sort of who you are. And I don't want to give the impression that I didn't have confidence. Like I, I, I had a pretty good ability to isolate different things in my life. So I wasn't like this, you know, real reserved, like held back kid that was in a sad state or anything like that. I just had these specific struggles. 
and and probably wasn't as confident as I could be. So confidence really was was just a direct delivery of of um, having success in the martial arts. And with that, it really showed me that I didn't have to accept things like not being good at baseball or not being good at the, at, at uh, academics, right? And this is something I would, you know, this, this builds, right? So I would say today I still learn it um, in, in various ways. But it showed me that if I could figure out how and I had the right level of discipline, that there was always a pathway to success and that being successful at something was more of a decision than it was granted. Um, so being bad at baseball, I identified as a bad baseball player. Once I became successful in the martial arts, I made a choice to not play baseball and to become successful at something else. And that was the martial arts at that time and, and some academic pursuits and maybe a few other things, right? But um, I think that that's really how that changed for me. And having that perspective on the change, right? Being sort of self-aware and, and seeing that change, it was, from a psychological standpoint, it was an easy way to wash away any of the negative that was created through some of those events, like your own team making fun of you. I realized there were silly kids I didn't quite know how to be successful at that at that time. And that's all it is. It, 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 there's no lasting effect for me. And, and, and again, I think it's because of learning that through the martial arts, you know, and, and gaining those perspectives. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It does, but it, it leads to more, of course, as, <laughs> as they all do. As a parent, as an instructor, how do you counsel people when they're going through a situation like that, especially someone at that age? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And it's it's probably a really complicated answer because like with many things like that, it really depends on the child and what they're going through. Um, you know, I really have, I think, an advantage because of the struggles that I went through, that particular struggle, the struggle I've had with learning certain things. You know, when I learn something, I really know how I learned it. So I think that, that I can turn around and apply that to teaching and, and make myself a better teacher. So I think that one thing it's taught me to do is really listen to the student first and foremost and really try to unpack specifically what they're going through because it may not be exactly what I went through or exactly what I've counseled another student in that they went through. Um, but you really need to unravel what that individual student is is going through. And then you can, once you understand that, I think you can bring some of these other pieces that you've learned throughout, um, you know, your life and your career and, and that you've learned. I mean, we're always learning from our students, right? So I learn a lot just by working with the students. But, you know, I think generally speaking, it's this idea that you can do things. You know, the idea is, is what do you want? Let's forget about the difficulty that you're having getting there and let's talk about what you want. And when we define what that is, then let's figure out what your path is to get there. And I'll give you an example, right? And I'm not going to name the student because I don't know that they would want me to or not, but there's a student that I have right now. And if this person's listening, he'll know who I'm talking about. And I have a, a ton of admiration for the student and I relate to the student quite a bit because um, like me, they, they, they struggle with some attention um, issues and um, it can really come across as some negatives in class. I'm sure academically and all that for them as well, but I can get very frustrated with them in class. They can get frustrated with themselves in class. Other students can get frustrated with them in class just because of this sort of, um, you know, lack of control and, and bursting out. And, um, and uh, an inability to kind of stay on task, right? And, and I've, one of the things that I talk to them about is I say, look, I have trouble staying on task. So when you're distracting me by not staying on task, it makes it twice as hard for me to teach class because now you're kind of pulling me with you, which is an interesting way, I think, to relate to that student. But the story I want to get to here is that this student and I sat down, this is not long ago, this is a recent story, and I just said, I said, look, like, 
I, I'm exhausted here. I'm tired of this. Like you are so good at what you do. You have such positive moments in what you do with us. You're becoming a leader in this dojo. Other students are looking up from you and you're really successful. Why do you think, I'm talking to the student, why do you think we keep having to circle back around to this where we're sitting in the office and we're talking about your, your behavior and the way you negatively impacted some students um, again and again and again? It doesn't seem like we should have to and it seems like something we can solve. And to this student's credit, his reaction to that kind of conversation is, I agree and I want to solve it. But like the situation I talked about, you know, it doesn't mean that he knows how to do that. It doesn't mean I know how to do that, right? It's a journey that the student and I have to take together. So we talked for a while, right? So we're searching at this point. I don't have any great answers here and, and, and neither does he, but we're talking, we're searching and this conversation quickly changes from kind of a disciplinary s conversation to a very adult conversation again to this kid's credit and this is why i admire him so much um he, he could be like angry and upset that somebody's calling him to the carpet again but he takes the mature approach of trying to figure this out and through this discourse we learn that one of the reasons why he sort of bursts out in class a lot is because he has an appreciation for comedy and for comedians and he's trying to be funny and this is another area that we kind of connect on because I love comedy too. Like who doesn't? Um, I can sit, you know, I, I run kind of a light class. I try to be funny in class a little bit to keep the students on their toes and entertained. And, you know, I like cracking a joke or trying to make somebody laugh um, in normal discourse too. But what it leads to is this discussion of timing, right? Mm -hmm. And this discussion of brevity, right? Brevity is the soul of wit. I think I may have mess that up a little bit, but that's a Shakespearean quote, I think, right? That sort of editing down makes things funnier. And timing makes things effective. So you can teach somebody the best jab in the world or the best cross, right? Or the best roundhouse kick in the world, and they can be the best at it. But if they don't have proper timing, they'll never land it and it'll never be effective for them. So through unpacking all this and landing on this kind of comedy theme with him, we discussed that maybe class was the time for him to work on timing. Because I told him, I said, if you say something and it brings down the class and everybody enjoys it, that's great. It's the every minute and a half saying something and only having 10 of them land and all and the other nine being distractions for everyone that I have a problem with. And if you really learn what's appropriate in class, and if you edit it down, really ask yourself before you deliver that thing that you think is funny, is this really worth it? Or do I want to hold out for something better? And that gave him a framework that he understood, that he appreciated, that reaches him towards some of his other goals to work on these issues that we're having in class. And I think that that really illustrates my approach for working with these students and, and, and really figuring out what's going to work for them. Wow. I, I'm, I have to confess that I'm, I'm just, I'm struck at again, how open and honest you're being and how that has translated into the way that you will run a class. I, I think we can all, any, anyone who's ever taught a class knows the, the challenge of teaching someone who is, is kind of, the comedian, you know, looking for that attention and how distracting it can be. But at the same time, a well, a well-timed comment that allows the, the class to stay up and entertained and engaged can be not only okay, but actually beneficial to people's attention span. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, there's some value in that sort of strict Japanese, like, you know, um, uh, regimented class, but I really appreciate an open class. And I really appreciate the personality of students being allowed to thrive in that class. Yeah. And, and I, I came up in that primarily strict environment. Most of the, class, the schools that I've trained in have had that. But the interesting thing I found is that most people do not seem to do their best in that environment. And so here you have this, this student who 
you actually find a way to get everybody on the same side of the table. Mm. They get to work on what they're working on. You're working on what you're working on. You're having an honest conversation about it. And I would guess that on the other side of this, everyone, including the unnamed students, is happier and, and better off for it. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I'm happier. They're happier. Even if it doesn't quite work, we can feel good that we really together worked on a solution that, that at least got us somewhere. You know, it, it may require reevaluation. It may require adjustment. And, you know, by the way, like, I don't want to give the impression that this is how it goes all the time. Right. This is a success. Like, this was a good one. I fall flat on my face probably more often than, than that kind of thing happens. But, uh, but that's, the, that's the ideal goal. And, and you know, and it, it takes two to tango, right? Like, I really, and, and if you're listening to me, bud, you know who I'm talking about. I really have to give this student a ton of credit for being, for being willing to play ball in this situation and not taking kind of a negative, I don't need to listen to you or, or something like that approach. Like it really does. You know, I've, I've been in that opposite situation where the student just, they, they're embarrassed, they're offended and they just either yes their way through it or, or rebel a little bit. And this guy's not that, that person at all. But despite it not working, you know, a hundred percent of the time, you still trusted the student. You still gave them the space to grow as not just a person doing punches and kicks, but as an overall human being. Oh, absolutely. And I don't know that most instructors are going to have the confidence to do that. Now, I, I've been the comedian in the class, and honestly, I still am. Mm-hmm. And once in a while, it, my timing isn't right. Sure. And it, and it does come across inappropriate. I'm, I'm, I freely admit that. Yeah. I'm, I'm but the right. way... Most instructors handle that. The way I did in the limited time that I had my own school was to just squash it. Because if it's, if the timing is never there to even question, it can't be a problem. Yeah. Well, and that's appropriate too at times. Like, again, I don't want to give the impression that sometimes I don't just put a finger out or give a stare or call somebody over and say, that's enough of that. You know, um, you're off the mat if it happens again. I mean, you've you've got to run a class, and you've got to run a class that's beneficial to everybody. Um, but you know, just like with anything, I think it's all comes down to the right balance. You know, and the private conversation with a student is is definitely different than the quick resolution you might come up with on the mat when you're trying to run a class. So I think that they're all valid valid approaches. You know, but just like the comedy, right? It's timing. It's the appropriate thing at the appropriate time that we all strive for. Right. Hmm. We've talked a lot about positive stuff so far. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Okay. We talked about how your entrance into martial arts came at a, an awkward, maybe even a a negative time, depending on how you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And you developed some skills, you acquire these tools that you were able to use later on. So tell us about a time somewhere into your martial arts career where you had some tools and you were faced with another challenging or negative situation and how you worked on it that time. Oh man, you know, there's a ton of stories like that. There's a ton of stories. I think that wouldn't even be martial arts oriented, you know, I mean, every day at work, uh, every day in my academic career, you know, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of stories here. So, the we'll start with a martial arts story. I've been I've been off on these kind of non martial arts tangents, but you know, um, if you listen back to Terry Dow's podcast, she did a great great interview with Terry, and and I have a, a an amazing amount of respect for him. And Terry and I started um, at this dojo around the same time. I would say within in within the year of me deciding to take martial arts instead of watching Charlie's Angels, uh, Terry for his reason showed up at that same dojo. And, um, he, uh, and he was a little bit younger than I was. Right. So I kind of, I think when I went through high school, when I graduated, he started, uh, we might've shared a year in the same school, but he was three or four years behind me. And, um, if you listen to his podcast, he talks about being picked on he talks about, um, you know, doing that final demo at the end of his senior year and and all that. And I'm not going to bore you with my story because it's the same. 
his carries. Um, but it was being picked on, I think, where I really first learned the power of the martial arts. And I had this uh, kid when I was a freshman in high school that every day in English class, he would come up behind me and he would do essentially um, what amounted to double shootos to my neck as a starting point every single time in class. And at this point, I was a brown belt in Kempo. And I really wasn't worried about my ability to defend myself. And he wasn't doing anything that was truly causing pain. And we, you know, as a traditional martial artist, learn your last resort is, is, is anything physical, right? So I'm not terribly interested in engaging with him, but I'm sort of interested in this, this hitting me every day when he walks in class and saying whatever he would say. I'm pretty interested in that stopping. So I sat down with my instructor at the time um, and uh, said, hey, this uh, guy named John O'Hearn, who was a huge influence um, on me very early in my martial arts career, ended up going into the military. Um, he, and I said, look, this is, this is the issue I'm having. And he said, geez, Mark, you, know, you, you can't sit there and let somebody hit you. Like, like, appreciate you learning the teachings of the martial arts and stuff, but you're not a punching bag. That can't happen. And you have to defend yourself you know um he goes so he goes try this next time i want you to stand up to him you know next time um he comes to the room and he hits you just turn around and say look stop it and if he doesn't stop it turn to him and say look you do it one more time i'm just going to break your knees i don't know why he came up with break your knees but he came up with break your knees so next time i was in english class i sat down and same pattern, right? He came in, he hit me, he started mouthing off. And in front of the class, I said, look, cut it out. I'm done. I don't want you to do this anymore. Oh yeah, what are you going to do about it? You hit me again, I'm breaking your knees. And he kind of took a bit of a step back. Oh, I forgot this part. I grabbed him. I was seated in my seat and I grabbed him by the shirt collar and I pulled him to my face to explain the whole knee breaking thing and then shoved him back. So there was a little bit of a physical presence there as well. Never would I have had the confidence to do anything like that before. And he sat back down and the kid that sat behind him was a student of mine. I was already, um, you know, an assistant instructor and stuff. And the kid that sat behind him had been in my class quite a bit. He was actually a, a real, real good, um, real good guy. And I saw him lean over and whisper in the, in the, the kid that had been picking on his ears and pull back. And um, I saw a change in his face, right, uh, from, from whatever was going on to a bit of fear. And um, he said, oh, so you know karate. Why do you have to use this karate stuff? And, you know, blah, 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 blah. I just kind of trying to, and I just looked, I said, look, there's no rule books in fighting. Like, if you're going to pick on me, I'm going to defend myself the way I defend myself. And he said, then I can do anything I want. And I said, you can I could bite you if I wanted to. And I said, look, not only can you, but I would suggest it because you're going to need a lot of help if this goes down. I'll tell you what, you meet me after school. I walk home this way. I see you walking home all the time and we'll figure this out. But I want it done. Once it's done, we're done with it, no matter what happens. And um, I, I never saw him. He never showed up. Um, I walked home for several uh, several days, couple of weeks in a row, he never showed up. I never really thought that I was going to have to fight him, but I knew I had to stand some sort of a ground. I'm not so sure looking back on it today that I did it perfectly, but it worked. Um, about two weeks later, he, we were walking and imagine the crowded high school, uh, hallways, right? So I'm kind of like shoulder to shoulder in this flow of the high school hallway. And he pops out of, uh, typing class and we end up shoulder to shoulder and we're looking at each other for the first time since this exchange. Oh no, I'm sorry. I pop, I came out of typing class and ended up next to him. And he looked at me and he's like, Oh, Hey, I was like, Hey, he's like, Oh, did you just come out of typing? I said, yeah. He goes, how was that class? I'm like, Oh, it was a great class. And from that point on, we were best friends. All it took was that kind of, you know, finally standing up after quite a, long time of him picking on me for him to change his ways. And I hope it had a positive influence on him because I never pushed it beyond that. You know what I mean? All I wanted was for it to stop. 
And I think he realized that when we got to that place, everything was good. And, um, and that was it. That was the end of it. Mm. So that's that story. That's martial arts working for me. And again, don't know that I handled it well. Perfect. How would you have handled it differently? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, looking back on it, I think that, you know, you learn as a teacher that you, you praise publicly and you chastise privately. I, I kind of wonder if maybe more just, you know, if you could just redo it and tune it perfectly, if I don't go up to him outside of class and private and say, look, this has got to stop. If it doesn't stop, I'm going to have to do what I'm going to have to do, you know, that kind of thing. And, and get and explain it out. I don't, I don't want to do it. Not what I'm here for. I'd rather be your friend. You know, we, we got there, but I had to be maybe a little bit more of a jerk than I really was comfortable with to get there or, or that's what I did at that time. Um, but you know, that's, that's Monday morning quarterbacking that, um, certainly at that young age, I was, wasn't on the fly able to uh, do that. I mean, I've been, I've been attacked on the street and, and, um, uh, had an opportunity to play a little bit more cool than that before. And, but that was as an adult. Right. So I think that Monday morning quarterback is, is important. I think that's how we, yeah. we learned it's, you know, Bro. in, in the moment of, of anything that's emotional, you know, it's, it's hard to separate logic from how you're feeling. And yeah, then only later when we've calmed down that we can really analyze. And I, I think that's critical. And it's something that I think far too few, far too few people do Mm. you know and and even in the context of non-threatening martial arts practice you know so many cell phones now and how often do people video someone in class and then show them and say see you are doing this thing wrong that i've been telling you for three years yeah well you know and i'd love to take credit for all that but but keep in mind that, that that everything i'm doing here is i've learned through the martial arts i mean even trying to handle it with finesse I didn't, you know, that's not, that wasn't just granted to me. That was through, you know, this, this great martial arts teaching. And I've been so fortunate, like you, you, you said earlier on, like, I don't know that I would know an instructor that would handle it that way or have the confidence to handle it that way. I would say the opposite. All I know is instructors that have the confidence to handle it that, that way. And that's what taught me. That's who I learned from. I mean, I, uh, people like uh, Sean Flanagan, who I know, again, Terry Dow, probably Alan Leo. Uh, you know, all, all these different people that you've had on your podcast may have reference back to Sean Flanagan, who's, who's known for Yoshitsune martial arts and Kempo. The, the things I learned from him, the things I learned from John Joyal, the things I've learned from Terry. I mean, Terry went from being, um, you know, a younger kid in the dojo to an instructor for me and somebody I look up to. Um, the things I've learned from Craig, the things I've learned from John English, who runs the, the KI studio, the things I've learned from my current Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor, um, Chris Ward. And, and, and the people that are above them, you know, that's, that's, that's the gift of the martial arts and, um, and, and knowing enough to handle things like that and to have that Monday morning quarterback insight, you know, to try and improve yourself. It's by design. Mm. And really, I mean, that's the, that's the whole purpose of what we do, isn't it? Absolutely. It's that improvement. So I think I had... I don't know where you want to go from here, but I had to, I, I, we could go anywhere. I mean, it, <laughs> it's it's been really interesting talking to you because we 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 go off and we go on these tangents, but but they tend to circle back and they leave us back at you know this fairly uh, neutral, and I, I definitely don't mean that in a negative way, but this very balanced place from where we could go in so many different directions again. And I don't know that I've I've experienced that. So for for me as the as the interviewer, this is this has been really unique. Oh well, that's. And it's, ch- it's challenging my skills and I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Good, I hope. No, well, you, you, you know, I, I kind of, I guess I promised you too that I was going to give you another story that was non-martial arts or, you know, not specific to the martial arts. That was kind of me being a, you know, turning into a little bit of a martial arts tough guy, if you will. Um, the other one is um, when I was in college, I was uh, going through a difficult time. My uncle had brain cancer. So he was, it, 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 that was a, like a year and a half ordeal before he passed away. Um, I had transferred from a two-year school to four-year school and was faced with academic challenges that were again, sort of beyond my capacity. And I had, um, through all this, um, I had uh, been academically suspended 
from school twice. So what an academic suspension is, is basically you, you underperform for the standards of the school and they say, all right, you got to take a break and come back. So that had happened twice. And when they do it the second time, they say, oh, and by the way, you can never come back. So I had a, a, a friend that was this, a, a, um, or my mom had a friend that was a, a professor at, at, at UNH. And um, so he gave me some advice and you could take a division of continuing education classes. And if I could bring my GPA back up through these division of continuing education classes, then I could petition to be let back in after this second academic suspension. And I can remember that there was a moment when I was walking, I was taking one of these D division of continuing education classes, DCEs is what they call them. And um, I was walking back and, and uh, I was walking to class from the um, sort of this offsite lot that you had to park park at. So it was a little bit, a little bit of a long walk and it was a good time to sort of think and reflect. And I had gotten a, a paper back from a teacher. And at this time I was in the, um, I was actually in a studio arts program and with a concentration of photography. I, I uh, in fact, if going back to Terry Dow, um, there was a picture he, I think he still uses as a logo. It's a silhouette and that's a picture I took. So, so this is one of my hobbies back in the day. Um, that I eventually turned into a profession and, and worked my way through college doing. And so I was taking classes and I was taking a history of photography class. And um, in, in this class, um, I had to write a paper. And I really respected this teacher. In fact, it might not even have been, a, it might've been just a history of art class, but she was my history of photography teacher as well. And um, so I wrote this paper and she, was very honest and the comments I, I got a really poor grade on it and the comments I got back on it were something to the effect of this is below high school level writing you should be embarrassed and you really need to figure this out if you're going to be successful in college and, and, and you mean this just struck deep right because I'm already not successful and now this person is being so brutally honest and and I, it was the best thing that she could have done because at this walk from the parking lot I had this moment and it and it reaches back to the beginning of what we were talking about when I started to realize that I could affect change so I had this moment where I was like wait a minute I can do this what I need to do is figure out what I need to do, what I need to learn, and, and figure out how to learn it. So at the time, and it, this is still the case, but not as badly, um, one of the consequences of being a poor student is that I was a poor speller. I was bad at grammar. I had no idea how to write. I had no idea how to structure a piece of paper, uh, a piece of paper, a, a, a piece of writing, um, any of it, right? The, the tools to do that weren't there in, in my mind. and. I said, enough is enough. And I rerouted myself to the uh, college bookstore. And I went through all the books in the bookstore. And I, and I said, I, there's got to be something that can show me how to spell. There's got to be something that can show me how to do grammar properly. I never learned this stuff in school, but I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to take control of this. And I found a book um, on spelling. Um, I found a book, uh, a couple of books on grammar, um, Strunk and White Elements Grammar, which I'm sure everybody knows, The Random House. Elements of Grammar, um, and uh, a Princeton book that was a grammar workbook. And I would wake up every morning and I would study these books. And I would, um, I uh, had a roommate that was a really good writer at the time. So I would sit down with him with everything I wrote and we would go over it and I would grill him and I would say, why are you doing this? How do you use this? How did you know to do that? And long story short, or long story not as long, um, I... I learned this stuff. I never became a great speller, but, be, but I became a better speller. I actually became really good at grammar. Something clicked through all this and I started to understand grammar and I started to understand the structure of writing. So I wrote, a, and this was the martial arts. This was my martial arts confidence and my martial arts structure working for me in a way off the mat. You know what I mean? And um, my final paper for her, it was a paper on, um, uh, Guernica, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which is a, a, a painting, a famous painting that Pablo uh, Picasso did. Um, it was the a, a war that took place in Mexico. I won't go into the boring details of that. But, um, and I wrote this paper. I worked with my buddy 
you know, he, he helped me through it a bit and um, turned it in and I got a really good grade on it. But the best part of it was that the teacher wrote on it, what an amazing difference from the first of the semester. This is a wonderful swan song for this class. You know, congratulations or whatever she said, but she acknowledged the improvement and how, how good the paper was at this point. And it was just an amazing, I mean, it was, it was uh, really no different than struggling in the martial arts and having your instructor tell you that you're doing a great job and you're ready to test for the next rank. I mean, it was that level of feeling. And I'm sure everybody listening to the podcast can relate to how exciting it is when an instructor gives you that validation that you're ready to test and how nervous you are, right? Which is true. I was nervous because I knew I now had to live up to this level of writing. And um, ultimately, I ended up publishing a magazine on the, um, when I graduated from school on, uh, on arts and uh, writing a bunch of the articles. I actually became a writer through that experience. And, um, and to this day, I'm known as being a, a pretty decent writer. So um, I, I don't have anybody. I mean, I have a, a lot of people to thank, but I mostly have the martial arts and the lessons I learned through all these wonderful people that have taught me wonderful things in the martial arts. Mm. Tribute to that. And I think that, you know, I guess the theme here is, and the thing that I really, if, if, I, if there's one thing I can convey is, is that that's what the martial arts is. The mar- martial arts is about how it changes you in your life. It has nothing to do with your ability to fight, or I shouldn't say nothing to do with your ability to fight, but that's, that's really just a catalyst for everything else. Mm. Such a, a powerful story. And, and what, I, what I'm most amazed by is that we've all had that experience. Mm. You know, even even those of us who did well in school had some subject or or even just one paper, one subject within a subject that just didn't click for them. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, most people aren't going to throw themselves at it and adjust. They'll they'll say, oh, this is just a thing I'm not good at. That's a great point. And I, I, you know, up until the point I threw myself at it. That's exactly what I was. I'm not a good speller. It was an identity. I'm not good at grammar. I'm not a good writer. But and it took a while for me to realize the martial arts taught me differently. I, I, I always say to people, and this is what it could, because this is what it's been for me, martial arts is like practicing all that information that you would read in a, help, in a self-help book every day. And that's why the self-help books don't work as well, right? Because you read it and you kind of maybe try to do it and then it fades for you. But when you show up on that mat every single day and you're accountable for the martial arts, you're, it's always top of mind. You're always practicing it. All you have to do is realize that it applies to these other areas hmm. and, and, and you'll apply it. Do you draw that connection for your students? Absolutely. Yeah. Because, Most instructors yeah. don't. It's so important to me to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that I do it as well as I'd like to, but, um, you know, I'll give you another story, another example that I had, I had a student who, um, for whatever reason, just this absolutely wonderful girl, and, and she's um, definitely met her challenges in life um, at home, at school, academically, and um, she was having difficulty, and I think really think it was wasn't through any any fault of hers other than her brain just didn't work the right way to do this but she couldn't remember the patterns of a form very easily and she had achieved high rank because she had been ranked on other merits but if you really looked at just her forms alone and i think she would admit this it was it wasn't it wasn't on par with the rest of her ranking right and um and you could tell that it was something that really bothered her so I pulled her aside one day and we went through, I, I have some methodologies, some different methodologies, as you can imagine, right? Having to come up with these things for myself um, to teach people things. And, and she and I went through pretty quickly and I laid out this, I laid or together, we sort of laid out this form. And um, at the end of, I don't know, call it like 20 or a 30 minute session, she was able to do this form and make every turn correctly, end up where she was supposed to end up, get to the end, she had the hugest smile on her face at the end of all this and 
all I could think of was, well, the, first of all, was like, oh my God, like, this is why I do this, right? Is to, is, is to see this kind of look on a student's face, but also that I know she's struggling in other areas of her life. So I, you know, I pulled her aside and just said, look, this isn't just karate forms here for you. You can do this anywhere. So when you have that challenge in school and the technique that we use is one that you could actually use academically as well. Um, but, you know, so I guess to your point, it was really important to me at that moment to, to take that feeling and that understanding that she had that, wait a minute, I went from thinking I couldn't do this to doing it, not knowing I could, but actually doing it to hold on to that so that she could carry that into other aspects of her life. And I hope that she has. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that that's why I do it. Not just important, but it's the why. I teach kids martial arts. Mm. You know? Because it's a piece I was given that I want to give them. A piece in that bucket. Right? Yeah. You know, and, and on that note, we're going we're gonna to start closing out the show. Oh, wow. because you just you, you just brought it full circle so beautifully that <laughs> anything else I ask you will ruin it. <laughs> well, wow. and, and I don't want to. Ruin I have all these the things prepared so from elegant. the list you gave me, but so elegant. well, good. Better to be over prepared, right? That's right. Great. Let's look. Let's look to the future. Everything we've talked about has been in the past. Mm -hmm. So if we look into the future, you know what's in store for you. I don't know. You know, that's a good question, and that is a that is one of the um, things that you sort of gave me a heads up on and probably the one that I didn't, an answer didn't really pop into my head very well. You know, as an adult, the reason why I've gone through the martial arts is because of my kids. I had a, uh, my oldest son um, went through the martial arts. He became uh, a black belt um, and it gave us a vocabulary. It gave us something in common. It gave us a vocabulary. I could say things to him and communicate with him in ways that other fathers and sons weren't communicating because we had this common vocabulary, the martial arts and the principles and the values and everything that the martial arts gave. My youngest son, I'm proud to say, and I mean this, this is not a joke, I am proud to say dropped out of the martial arts. I always told myself that I wouldn't um, uh, force my kids into the martial arts, but if they wanted to do it, I would support it. And he, it was hard for him, but he came to me, he's like advanced green, somewhere in the middle of the belt ranking system. I can never keep track of the new systems. And um, he came to me and said, uh, basically, he didn't want to do it anymore. Talked to his mom, talked to me. And um, he loves to skateboard. And he wanted to dedicate his time to skateboarding. And if you're listening to this right now, you're going, oh my gosh, as a martial arts father, how can you be okay with your son not doing martial arts and going to skateboard? I'm here to tell you right now that there is no difference in martial arts and skateboard. He gets on that skateboard. He has a very serious routine. He falls off of it over and over and over and over again. He fails over and over again to succeed, to learn one little trick. And when he learns that trick, he builds upon that to learn the next one by falling and failing over and over and over again. And to me, that's the martial arts. That's the thing the martial arts teaches you to do is to create that path of success through failures. And he's doing that with skateboarding and he's becoming a leader. He's inspiring me. I'm 49 years old. I'm going to be 50 in July. At 48, I showed up at the skate park with my son and I've fallen down. Thank you to Judo Ukimi for teaching me how to fall because <laughs> I needed it when I started skateboarding with him. But we go to the skateboard. I'm becoming a better skateboarder. He's a way better skateboarder than I am. Um, so I look up to him. I look up to what he does. And, um, you know, so I think my path is probably to continue teaching. I want to get my black belt in um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I've, I've uh, worked through um, Chris Ward and, and the Rodrigo Gracie system there. I love being a white belt at stuff. I love learning and I've got a long, long path ahead of me there. But it is to, with my kids, my family, my friends, to find these other pathways that are so similar to the martial arts. These skateboarders are like, like a, a modern day samurai just testing their skills in different places over and over and over again. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to do that with my son. I'm going to continue to train Yoshitsune and I'm going to continue to give my pieces back to my students. Awesome. And if anybody wants to find you online, how, how would they do that? Email, social media, websites, yeah. any of that? Um, 
So you can connect with me through uh, either Fusion, um, uh, which is a martial arts uh, dojo in Stratum, um, Sean Flanagan, uh, uh, Chris Ward, um, Keith Walsh all run a great, um, uh, they do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai. Um, we teach Yoshitsune combat Jiu Jitsu, which is through the Deepa Squally family. Um, you know, my, my love for the Deepa Squally family and what they've given to the martial arts, uh, through that dojo. I also teach at Karate International with Craig Wareham, John English, um, and a lot of great people over there. Um, so I can be connected through there as well. My email is Max Marks, that's with an S, Max Marks dot Miller, M I L L E R, at Gmail. Um, you can always hit me up there. I probably have Life Skills at the Dojo, was the site I maintained for a while that I haven't touched for a while. It's probably still out there as well. So you can look at me, look me up through there. Um, I'm on Facebook, but I don't pay attention to it to a ton, but you can um, try me there as well. Okay. And of course, uh, this is the first time we've said it on this episode. If, if folks, Want. We have the show notes. If you're new, you might not know where we put those. Whistlekick martial arts radio.com. So we'll have everything that Mr. Miller's mentioned today over there. You know, I really appreciate your time. This has been a lot of fun and and uh one of the, the most challenging episodes for me, not in any kind of a negative way, but just it made me stretch a little bit. And I appreciate that. And and you know, if we were training on the mat, that would be a pretty high compliment. So I hope you take it in that way. Appreciate it. Thank you. So one more thing before we head out, and I think you know that, know that we do this, what parting words would you give to the folks listening today? You know, I think that uh, I would just say, look, the martial arts are about so much more than what you see and what you think they might be when you look at people working on that mat. And um, there's no age limits. We have people that are 60 years old that are starting martial arts for this first time. And we have, you know, the young tiny tots coming in and training. And, um, you know, I just think that it doesn't have to be the martial arts, but the martial arts is a really, really good one out there to just go and practice those life skills, really, um, give yourself a safe environment to fail and work on the things that you need to work on to be who you want to be. So a lot of good dojos out there. If you're, if you're in the martial arts or not, um, you know, Keep doing what you're doing or try it out. It could, could be just a thing that, that you're looking for. When I reflect back on this episode, I think the thing I'm most struck by is the awareness. The awareness for who Mr. Miller is, but more so, more importantly, the awareness for who his students are, where they've been, where they're headed, and the role that he can play in guiding them. And I think that that's the word that I most want to hone in on is guiding. Not all instructors are guides. Some of them are sculptors. Some of them are supporters. But here, and I don't want to pretend that any one role is more important than the other. We all need all of them. But it's so clear that Mr. Miller is a guide for those students who come into his life for whose lives he enters. And I am sure because I've gotten to meet a few of them, that they're better off for it. Thank you so much, sir, for your time today. If you want to find some photos, show notes, transcript, all the other episodes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you've never left us a review, please head on over to iTunes or use whatever platform you use for a review. Give us a few stars, however many seems appropriate. And if you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 saves you 15% at Whistlekick.com. I'm Jeremy. My email address, nice and simple, Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. And that's it. I'll get out of here. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Yeah. <laughs>